Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. The goal of this series is to help you understand that your participation in clinical trials matters. We now have heard many times that yesterday's trials are today's therapies. I started this series because I had to ask myself, how long do I want to wait for a myeloma cure to be found? And what can we do as patients to move that discovery forward faster? There was a lot we can do besides donate to a foundation, although that is a great option, but we can join clinical trials. So that, of course, is my cheerleading for today. Um, I encourage you to sign up for our Inpatient Minute newsletter where we post our upcoming show and our past interview in a weekly email. You can do this on our homepage, www.mpatient.org, where you will find links to our Twitter and Facebook pages as well. So we encourage you to tell your myeloma friends and because it's a great way to hear what is happening in myeloma all over the world. So I'm very happy and delighted to be having a conversation today with Dr. Langre of the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for joining us. We feel so excited. Um, the UAMS program is very well known, and I'm very happy to be discussing your research um, at the largest U.S. center with a single disease focus on myeloma. And I'd like to share a short profile of you for our listeners, if that's okay. That is fine. Um, Dr. Von Prey is a professor of medicine and director of clinical research with the Myeloma Institute for Research and Therapy at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. He earned his MD at Erasmus University of Rotterdam in the, in the Netherlands and his PhD at the University of London. He was a fellow in hematology and a research fellow at the Hammersmith Hospital and Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London. He was also a Registrar Fellow in Hematology at John Radcliffe University Hospital at Oxford and at the University Hospital in Nottingham. Dr. Von Rey's research focus is on immunotherapy. He leads the Developmental Therapeutics Project in the Myeloma, Institute PO1, Myeloma Institute's P01 grant called Growth Control in Multiple Myeloma from the National Cancer Institute. He's a member of the International Society for Experimental Hematology, the International Society for Cellular Therapy, and the European Group for Bone and Marrow Transplantation. He's on the editorial board for Annals of Hematology, Bone Marrow Transplantation, and Cytotherapy, and he reviews for many journals, including Blood, Clinical Cancer Research, and the British Journal of Hematology, and many others. So, Dr. Van Prey, we are very privileged to speak to you today. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very happy to be on the, on the show. Would you like to start by giving us kind of an overview of um, total therapy and where it's headed? Um, yes, we, we started total therapy back in 1989. The idea of total therapy is to apply uh, all available dr drugs up front you know, in an attempt to, cu to cure the disease. Uh, the approach was actually modeled on the treatment of childhood leukemia, in childhood leukemia uh, induction, chemotherapy is used to bring the disease under control, then there is consolidation to, to further start to reduce the tumor burden, and then there is maintenance to, to eliminate any, any remaining cancer cells. Using that approach developed at St. Jude's Children's uh, Hospital uh, in Memphis, the cure rate in the 1970s and 80s was only 5% of childhood uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And currently, it has risen to, 90, uh, to over 90% with, with the total therapy approach. So enormous progress has been made. And our total therapy approach really has been modeled uh, on that. So we use combination chemotherapy to reduce the disease burden. And then the multiple transplant is a way of getting the patient in remission. Typically, an, one mouth lung transplant uh, gives you a remission rate of, uh, of 20%. And the idea of doing two 
that uh, also from the Sanjutsu observation that when they achieved the complete remission rate of 40% in their patients, that they saw patients being cured. So we, we had early on a very simple idea, let's do two transplants, we get a complete remission rate of 40% and maybe we'll be curing some patients. In the early days, we had maintenance with drugs like dexamethasone interferon. We later discovered thalidomide here. Uh, we added a consolidation and then maintenance with thalidomide. And in total therapy three versions, we started introducing drugs like bortezomib and thalidomide and resumid during the treatment program. So we made enormous progress uh, in uh, patients uh, which we call standard or good risk. We, we separate patients based on gene expression profiling. So what we do is we harvest, we take a bone marrow sample, we select the myeloma cell, and we look which genes are overexpressed and which genes are underexpressed. And using that method, we can get a molecular picture of the disease and we can separate the patients into two groups. One, one group at diagnosis is 85% of patients have standard or good risk disease, and 15% have what we call high risk disease and have an increased risk of relapse. Both uh, groups of uh, patients go with equal ease uh, into remission, but the high risk group has a, has a bigger risk of relapse. Recognizing that, we are now treating patients with high-risk disease uh, on a different protocol. So we're presently the only group which assign treatment to patients based on, on the genetic picture uh, of the disease. And I think we'd love to hear what you do for the different two different groups. At the moment, for the, we're getting very good results with the, sta- with the standard or, or good risk group. They get uh, two cycles of induction chemotherapy, two transplants, uh, about three months of pyrex, two dose reduced, what we call consolidation, and three years of maintenance with bortezomib, lenalidomide, and uh, dexamethasone. Then the high-risk patients we approach differently. We think that many of these patients have very rapidly growing disease and we try to shorten the disease the treatment free intervals in non hodgkin's lymphoma the germans a german group has pioneered using chemotherapy uh, given more closely together in aggressive lymphomas and found better outcome there so what we do uh, is we give these patients chemotherapy on a, a six, six weekly basis. The chemotherapy and, and the transplants are even closer together. So, um, and the transplants are uh, of lower doses than, in the, than for the good risk patients. So we give treatment actually more frequently, but uh, when, but when you calculate the cumulative drug doses, you actually, they actually get less total amount of chemotherapy. The idea is to continue to give chemotherapy and to prevent regrowth of the tumor. If you do two, two transplants three months apart, you can already have regrowth of the cancer cells. So we, we rely on, on drugs working together, which we refer to as synergism between drugs, and applying the treatments frequently in order to keep to continue killing the cancer and preventing regrowth of the myeloma cells. Paradoxically, although we say we, we give more intense chemotherapy, the, the regimen, because we give less cumulative chemotherapy, is actually, it's not an, a tough treatment program for, for the high-risk patients. Is there any age kind of restriction that you have or no? It's tolerable for everybody. Well, tolerability of is, is obviously determined by the fitness of the patient Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent also by age. But our frontline protocols are designed for patients up to 75. And whether somebody can handle a more 
aggressive treatment program is determined to some extent by age and obviously also by the, the presence uh, of other medical illnesses. Well, let me ask a question that sort of backs up a little bit because when you're talking about gene expression profiling, I know this test came out of UAMS and is not available to everybody. Um, I was at a patient conference where I kind of asked everybody to raise their hand and, to see if they had had this test done and only about 10% of the people had, had had this test done. So can you help us determine beyond the tr different translocations, does it does it determine that is, is that the test that determines the translocations? Because I know some of the some of that is coming out of the cytogenetics test and the fish test. And can you kind of explain that for us? Sure. There, uh, we're we're talking really a little bit about about three di different tests here. Okay. Uh, the first test is is called metaphase cytogenetics. Uh, what you do is you put the myeloma cells in culture, and when they're dividing, you, you can actually see the, uh, the individual chromosomes under the microscope, uh, and you can see whether there are abnormalities there. In, in our hands, about 30% of patients will have abnormal chromosomes visible. In 70% of patients, the test is not informative, and the reason for that is that the myeloma cells cannot grow outside the bone marrow, so they need the support of the bone marrow to grow. It means that these patients have less aggressive disease. So the advantage is that, uh, of the metaphase cytogenetics is that you identify the patients with more proliferative, more aggressive disease, uh, and you can look at all, all the chromosomes under the microscope the disadvantage that is that it's not informative in 70% of patients. The FISH test, which has especially been promoted by the Mayo Clinic, uh, is you look at certain hot spots on the chromosomes and you look with specific probes. So you can, for instance, see whether chromosome 4 and 14 are linked uh, together, which is an, not uncommon abnormality in myeloma. So the FISH test you can do on resting myeloma cells. They don't need to be dividing in the test tube. And it's uh, informative in all patients. The limitation is that you, can, uh, that you can only see what you look for. In other words, there are a limited set of probes and a limited set of abnormalities which can be looked for. So again, the advantage is informative in everyone. The limitation is that you can only see what you look for. Gene expression profiling is actually commercially available, and again, you purify the myeloma cells and you extract the genetic material, apply it to chip, and you can see which which genes are on uh, or off, and you get a molecular picture of the multiple myeloma. Based on that, we've recognized at least six subgroups of multiple myeloma, and then again based on the expression of 70 genes, which are either highly overexpressed or underexpressed, we can assign patients to high risk or, or conversely lower standard risk. Um, can, you, can you identify those six groups or what those, uh, would, what those are? Yes. We, we, we're, the groups are uh, identified on the expression of 100 genes, 50 are over, 50 underexpressed. And we got a disease group which we call low bone disease, in which the patients truly have low bone disease. And we got a CD1 subgroup, a CD2 subgroup, the MM6 subgroup, where there's very often translocation for 14. Uh, we got a proliferation subgroup, where the patients uh, uh, typically have more aggressive disease with activation of genes involved in, in, in the growth of cells. And then we've got a subgroup identified by the activation of certain oncogenes, which are called MAF and MAF-B. So those some are some of the molecular subgroups that we identify. And to make things more complicated, um, if we then look our, at our uh, 70 gene model, we find that most of the patients with low bone disease have standard risk. 
and there's enrichment for high-risk disease in the proliferation subgroup uh, and to a lesser extent in the 414 subgroup and the, and the MASH subgroup. So it's very complicated. So myeloma, there, there, uh, there are a number of molecular subgroups and then we've got high and low risk disease. So myeloma is really multiple uh, diseases. And there's also an important subgroup which we uh, refer to as the hyperdiploid subgroup where patients have more than one chromosome, typically of uneven chromosome numbers, that is chromosome 3, uh, 5, 7, 9, etc. Well, it is complicated, and so it's nice to have someone help us explain it <laughs> in terms that we can understand. Yeah. But it, it, it's, it's important to, to, to understand that myeloma is, is really multiple diseases, and to some extent you could even say that every patient has a unique disease. And so, because UAMS probably has a very enviable position, having very long-term data and a lot of it, can you explain how you approach this at UAMS, where, I guess, how you look at um, that data, and some of it has to do with databases. I know there are uh, some facilities that it's a challenge, it's just a technical challenge, putting all the data together and kind of subdividing it based on the database that you have, not just the research that you have, but the database that you have. Yeah, I think one of the one of the uniqueness of our program is that we try to follow um, all our patients lifelong. So total therapy also means long, long-term follow-up uh, on our patients. The program here was initiated by Dr. Barlicky in 1989, and we have still patients coming from that era we make an effort to really follow everybody long term in order to get an idea of what the long term outcome is and also uh, the impact and side effects of certain treatments. We had a, a, a trial, a randomized trial initiated in 1998 called Total Therapy 2, where patients were randomized to thalidomide or no thalidomide during their treatment program. And the long-term follow-up shows that differences in overall survival took eight years to emerge, which is really a very interesting observation and also points to the need for for long-term follow-up patients to discern late-appearing outcome differences. I think the other uniqueness of the program is that right from the beginning, we've been doing the metaphase cytogenetics on all patients, MRI. We started uh, doing PET scanning uh, systematically starting in the late 90s, and gene expression profiling was added in 2000 to the workup of the patients. So we got a very comprehensive data set on, on our patients. And what does the imaging add? This uh, really pertains to the issue of how you define complete remission. At the moment, we say that complete remission is that the bone marrow needs to be clear and that there should not be any myeloma protein detectable uh, in in the peripheral blood or urine. Um, Clearly, in the MRI, we can see that 50% of patients will achieve an MRI uh, remission over time. We also know that the number of focal lesions at diagnosis in the MRI influences outcome. The PET scan is based on a sugar dye, which is taken up by the myeloma cells, and you can see hot spots. Uh, The PET scan will image the whole body, so you can also detect myeloma outside the bone marrow. We know that the number of focal lesions at diagnosis has prognostic significance. We also know that, especially in the high-risk group patients, if you still have active disease after uh, induction chemotherapy on the PET scan, that you have worse outcome. The changes on the PET scan are very dynamic and occur rapidly. So uh, on follow-up PET scanning after one cycle of chemotherapy, you can see very significant changes. Changes on the MRI occur uh, much more slowly, and achievement of MRI remission 
typically takes 18 to 24 months. Okay, well, diagnostics is very important, and it sounds like there are multiple approaches. And the other thing I might add is, since we systematically follow everybody with both imaging modalities, uh, we do see patients where the first sign of relapse is not the reappearance of the myeloma protein or the reappearance of the myeloma cells in the bone marrow, but in fact we see a spot of myeloma growing uh, or several spots on the PET scan or uh, uh, MRI. So uh, we do see uh, that the first sign of relapse can be uh, only detected uh, with imaging studies. Wow, so how frequently do you recommend that your patients do that? Uh, we typically do an MRI or PET scan after every cycle or chemotherapy or after uh, every transplant. But during the maintenance phase, we follow them every four to six months. And eventually, once they're off maintenance, they go to six monthly and eventually yearly follow-up. Okay, and I just have a follow-up question. This may be kind of a dumb question, but if, if focal lesions are a very big indicator and then someone goes into complete remission, do those are those lesions able to heal completely that you see on the imaging studies? Uh, that's a very good question. So it, it depends on uh, to which extent the, the normal bone has been damaged. If there has been a, a lot of erosion and destruction of the bone, then the MRI may never look normal again. Obviously, the PET scan is a functional imaging study. It looks at actively growing myeloma cells, and the PET scan can be negative in patients who still have focal lesions on uh, MRI. Uh, we have also systematically done biopsies of these focal lesions. In many patients, we do not find myeloma. There are patients uh, who still have dormant myeloma cells in the focal lesions. So one of the areas of interest is whether these focal lesions in some patients can be dormant sites, sites where the myeloma can hide, and eventually where, the, where relapse may or originate from. Hmm. Well, while we're talking about diagnostics and, and complete remission, do you want to talk about minimal residual disease and how you're testing for that? Yes, I think the minimal residual disease has been especially promoted by a Spanish group, group in Salamanca, mm -hmm. Professor uh, San Miguel, um, and his uh, specialist there on, in this area uh, is Dr. Bruno Paiva. He developed a, me a method where he stains the cells with antibodies, uh, and he stains certain molecules at the cell surface, um, and they run it through a machine called a flow cytometer, and you can see the cells which stain where certain molecules at the cell surface light up, and you can identify them. And this way you can identify, you can separate normal plasma cells from myeloma plasma cells, and you can detect very small numbers of uh, uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow. Sensitivity can be as high as one in a million, which means that you can pick out one myeloma cell in the background uh, of a million uh, normal cells. Um, studies done uh, in, in England suggest that if you have no minim minimal residual disease detectable, that your outcome is uh, is better. So this is something uh, that we've this type of minimal residual disease testing by uh, this test called flow cytometry we've adopted here. And we're doing this systematically uh, on all our patients, uh, and we're prospectively collecting data, and we're trying to figure out what it means. Um, now, as I understand it, there's different sensitivity that can be performed on this flow cytometry test, and it has to do with the number of colors that are being run. Can you explain what the significance is of the colors? We use the eight-color flow cytometry, and every color identify and to identifies a different molecule. And more colors will uh, give you greater sensitivity in detecting small number uh, of cells, and you can characterize the cells better. You can de detect them better in the, in the background of normal cells. 
so uh, in general terms in, in, in cancer we, we know that the presence of a, a few number of cancer cells doesn't necessarily mean that the patient is going to relapse early in my career I was involved in a disease, chronic myeloid leukemia, which was treated at that time with transplantations from bone marrow transplantation from donors. And we had patients who were uh, in remission for more than 10 years and cured for all practical purposes. We still had a few chronic myeloid leukemia cells detectable in the marrow using very sensitive molecular techniques. And in fact, recently I saw in the clinic a patient who had been in uninterrupted remission for 13 years and still had a, had a positive minimal residual disease test. So we'd mm-hmm. like to analyze our data uh, in the context of molecular subgroup and risk, because it may mean different things in different types of myeloma, and that's an ongoing area uh, of research. Maybe in some types of myeloma, it's not that important if you can detect a few remaining cells and it and it doesn't influence an outcome. And in other subgroups of myeloma, one, one can speculate that any remaining cells could be predictive of relapse. Okay, and I, as I understand it, um, and this has happened to a friend of mine, after treatment, sometimes that your profile changes. The genetic profile so, uh-huh. of the disease can change. Sometimes the, the, at, at relapse, the disease is more aggressive. When we look at our program, uh, when we look at the relapsed patients, 50% have high-risk disease and 50% have standard or low-risk disease. Up front, at, the, at diagnosis, 85% have standard risk disease and 15% have low-risk disease. Hmm. So one of the interesting questions arises how this difference uh, comes about. And we're involved, like uh, many other groups now, doing what is called uh, sequencing, uh, actually sequencing the genes of, of the myeloma cells. And one can postulate that some patients already have a small number of aggressive, very mutated cells present at diagnosis. Um, and that the treatment clears out the easier disease and that then the aggressive disease rears its head uh, and causes uh, relapse. In other patients, there might be perhaps still residual disease present and uh, over time additional mutations arise and then the patient transforms to high-risk disease. So there are different models on on how high-risk disease can come about and the patient starts off initially with low-risk disease. Mm, interesting. And how do you do the sequencing? There are different methods. The sequencing can be done uh, of the DNA or of the RNA. We're having both platforms here. One of the things we're trying to do is to, to identify what is called druggable targets. So we try to identify mutations which may be amenable to drug therapy, which is usually used in other cancers. For instance, there we quite often see mutations in a certain pathway, and we, we can use drugs to treat these patients, which are use different uh, uh, cancers. Well, that that would be the low-hanging fruit approach, right? To yes. see what's what's already available and see if we can use it. So if you if you were saying that there are 70 genes, that's a lot of genes to try to target, and you're trying to put your data together, and I would think overlap it with each patient type to see if you can find similarities. Have you found certain genes that, like a, a targeted list of five or ten, or have you been able to narrow down the list a bit? Uh, we have been able to, to narrow down the list. There appear to be five genes which are quite critical in determining the outcome. So we can narrow down from 70 to five genes and make very similar predictions in terms of outcome. Okay, and um, as I know that the testing is getting cheaper and cheaper, should everybody be doing this gene sequencing 
test? Five gene tests I, I refer to the, is done by gene expression profiling, but it, that okay. test could potentially be, be set up with a different molecular method and could be done more cheaply and easier. I think the sequencing, which is not only done here, but also at other centers, is really in its initial phase, and it will uh, require considerable time to try and figure out what uh, all the, the changes in the genes mean. So in other words, it needs to be seen in the context of treatment and long-term clinical outcome. So it's very exciting new technology but it will take several years to try and figure out what uh, what exactly the important alterations are and what it what it means for treatment. And now I know that um, we've heard that maybe up to 10% of myeloma patients are potentially I say this cautiously quote cured, and we don't know, but we think. I'm just curious, who are these people? <laughs> so what are their what are their profiles? That's a very good question. We, uh, when we uh, add other markers, such as the B2 microglobulin, which mainly reflects tumor burden, presence or absence of abnormal metaphase cytogenetics. If we add that to the gene expression profile, we can identify subgroups of patients with, with very good outcomes. When you look at uh, the issue of curability, is very uh, uh, interesting. When you look at acute leukemia, you can see that the survival curve becomes flat. In other words, patients don't come out of remission at, at around five years in, in, a, in a pre childhood leukemia. We've done similar um, analyses in, on our myeloma patients, and it looks like if you are going to be in remission for 10 to 12 years or longer, that uh, we see very few relapses there. So we think that at least in some patients that the disease is curable. And obviously, that's that's good news for the myeloma patients. Yeah, every everybody wants to raise their hand to be in that group. And I, I think if I could ma- wave a magic wand right now, I would really like to see myself categorized in context so I could see, for example, I have MAF-B, which is not a great thing, but you know my cytogenetics might be good and, and the other indicators might look really good. So could I find all the patients that look like me and then see what they've done, who's lived the longest, and and go backwards? You know, what kind of approach worked for that subtype? I think that's what I would love to see. When we compare our successive regimens, we can recognize groups which seem to be particularly benefiting from certain drugs. For instance, in Total Therapy 2, we did not have bortezomib in the program because it was not available yet at that time. In Total Therapy 3, we did have bortezomib, and we could see that particularly the patients with a translocation between chromosome 4 and 14, patients with a deletion of a tumor suppressor gene called P53, uh, patients with abnormal metaphase genetics, these were the patients who really benefited for, from the bortezomib. And that brings us to the next really question, is how we can target our therapies better. In other words, uh, we're trying to figure out who, who needs what, what drugs. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, for the good risk patients, the goal has to be to make the treatment uh, safer and to target the treatment better. The high-risk patients, I think the way we define high-risk, those patients have a a much higher uh, relapse rate. We think that maybe in the order of 15 to 20 percent of patients in the long term of that group of patients uh, might be curable, but they often relapse early. And that's a group of patients which really requires new approaches uh, and new insights and perhaps also new drugs. Would you like to talk about your um, where total, total therapy is now and how you're approaching these two different types in your clinical trials? Yes, in, um, in the, uh, the total therapy spies, we're using combination treatments uh, frequently applied at six weeks intervals and the patients get five of such treatments and then go to maintenance. 
Is this for standard yeah. or high risk? Uh, that's for high risk. Okay. And we are we are going to uh, introduce in the high risk group uh, in the next few weeks up front also the drug the new proteasome inhibitor uh, carfilzomib in this particular group of patients. So carfilzomib is a uh, drug which binds irreversibly to the proteasome. The proteasome is like garbage disposal system of the cell. It gets rid of unwanted proteins, mm-hmm. um, and if you interfere with that uh, mechanism, the cells will die. So we found that patients who were treated up front with prosisome inhibitor bortezomib, that some of these patients still responded to the carfilzomib drug. Hmm. So it, in our hands, it looks like carfilzomib is more potent than bortezomib. Mm-hmm. Um, we also think that there is possibly some more toxicity associated with it at least in the, in the patient that we've been using it in the relapsed refractory setting where we see a higher toxicity signal uh, in terms of cardiac uh, side effects. Um, however, that can be mitigated by very careful monitoring of the patient. Obviously, uh, cardiac side effects are much less when it's used up front uh, in patients who haven't been heavily treated. And in neuropathy, how is it different in neuropathy? It does not give rise uh, uh, to, to neuropathy or rarely, so there is a, a lot of difference uh, in terms of neuropathy. In all fairness, the, uh, the administration of subcutaneous bortezomib has made a major impact on the side effect profile of bortezomib, and there is significantly less neuropathy with subcutaneous administration of bortezomib. Hmm. Okay. Is there are there other areas that you'd like to other clinical trials you'd like to talk about for high risk patients? We are using at the moment immunotherapy to try and treat patients with high risk disease who have relapsed. We use so called natural killer cells, which we co incubate with, stim- with stimulator cells, and we, then we activate them and expand them. And then we infuse these highly activated cells after uh, uh, chemotherapy into the patient uh, where they persist. And we see the large numbers of these immune cells uh, activating and growing and expanding in the patient. Eventually, they will lose their uh, activity uh, o- over time. This treatment is very early in its development. and. We had to go through a learning curve as how to best make the cells, and we made several modifications in in the laboratory in, in how best to expand them uh, and activate them. So the results are, are early, and we hope that uh, that the expanded and cell therapy can contribute to the treatment of the high risk patients. The other area where we're exploring uh, this type of therapy is in patients with smoldering myeloma. Mm -hmm. Smoldering are at increased risk uh, of progression to frank myeloma compared to the the benign monoclonal gammopathy, also Mm -hmm. called MGUS. And based on our gene expression profile, we've identified a group of patients who are at high risk uh, of progression to frank myeloma. And in this group of patients, we're also going to explore the expanded uh, and queso uh, therapy. Obviously, the Spanish have done a trial with, with Revimit and Dexamethasone, uh, the Spanish collaborative group, mm-hmm. and shown that in some patients with high risk smoldering disease treated with Revimit and Dexamethasone, that it delays progression of the disease and improves uh, outcome. So there is a debate in the myeloma community towards whether we should treat uh, early high-risk smoldering disease uh, earlier. The standard of care thus far has been and still is uh, to observe these patients carefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, and But there are a number of clinical trials ongoing now where these patients are actually being treated early and to see whether the outcome uh, is better with early intervention in high-risk smoldering multiple myeloma. And so what is your um, what is your opinion so far? 
you're not running trials currently, right? For smoldering well, myeloma uh, for that or no? Uh, except for the expanded uh, immuno, uh, in case of oh, okay. therapy. Mm-hmm. Immunotherapy, uh, that's the only trial that you currently have open. Uh, we're plan another one mm-hmm. uh, with a monoclonal antibody. But uh, as such, there's an increased uh, uh, interest in the myeloma community uh, in treating high-risk smoldering disease earlier. And could you take a does, could you take a minute and just give us a quick explanation again for of NK cells and then what's the difference between a regular NK cell and an expanded NK cell? Okay, an ex- expanded N- NK cell is highly active, so it kills other kills the tumor cells much better than a resting NK cell. The other aspect of the activation is that it induces the NK cells to multiply. So once we uh, grow them in the lab, they, we expand the numbers of NK cells, so you have more NK cells uh, to attack myeloma cells. And after infusion in, into the patients, we continue to expand for another seven to 10 days. So you get cells which, one, have more uh, activity and can kill the myeloma better, uh, and secondly, they uh, continue to expand in the patient. And how do you get them to expand? We we uh, incubate them with a special st- stimulator cell, which expresses at the cell so- surface a molecule called interleukin-15, which is a growth factor for natural killer cells. And it also expresses a molecule for, uh, called foron BB ligand, which further stimulates the uh, the activation of the natural killer cells. This particular stimulator cell was uh, developed by Dr. Dario Campana at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, and he has an interest in treating, obviously, childhood kid lymphoblastic leukemia with this, and he was so kind to share these cells with us, and we've adopted this technology to try and treat multiple myeloma. Well, I think the whole area of immunotherapy is so exciting, um, and this is where your background is. So, correct. I think there there are a lot of um, interesting studies in in uh, in the solid tumor area, where one can show that monoclonal antibodies, which take the break of the immune system, can actually induce responses uh, and sometimes even remissions in patients with solid tumors which were uh, otherwise not uh, not salvageable. Obviously, solid tumors are much more frequent than, uh, than the blood cancers, so the pharmaceutical companies understandably have focused initially on the development of these uh, antibodies in the uh, solid tumor arena. Uh, but trials are now starting to emerge also in multiple myeloma, it would be very interesting conceptually to combine these antibodies with uh, drugs which stimulate the immune system. These are the immunomolitary drugs, which we refer to drugs like Revomit or lenalidomide and, and uh, the newer version, uh, pomalidomide. Mm-hmm. So I think there, there will be a lot of uh, exciting studies forthcoming in, in future with immunotherapy. And what phase is your in case cell study? Uh, this is what we call a, a phase uh, two study. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is an efficacy uh, endpoint. Um, so far, the cells certainly have been safe. We've not seen any side effects. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of immunotherapy: is that you're using your own your own system to try to fight these cancer cells. That's that's correct. Yes. Are there other trials that you'd like to share with us that you have open? We're obviously also using the oral proteasome uh, inhibitor, which is a newer version uh, of bortezomib, uh, Mm -hmm. which is more convenient for the patient. And we also have an interest in using placental-derived stem cells to to treat patients. One of the side effects of some of the therapies that we give is a, a disease called myelodysplastic syndrome, and this arises 
after treatment and it's a disease in which the normal bones, bone marrow does not grow, not grow well and there's a risk of transformation to acute leukemia. To the clinical myelodysplastic syndrome in about uh, 2% of our patients uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome requiring therapy and we're starting to give uh, placental derived stem cells which we think may support normal uh, hematopoiesis. So that's early in its uh, development as well. That's great. Um, I just have a quick backwards question because, and I want to ask you before I forget it, when you say you've narrowed down the seven genes into five, can you tell me what those five are? At the moment, it's going to be published, so it will be. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, it will be out there soon. It's actually in the, under submission at the moment. Okay, and when you look at when you say the um, immunotherapies, it'll be interesting to see, and I think it will be. Um, how long do you think it will take for us to come to conclusions, or for these studies to to show us if those are really effective with myeloma? I think uh, the highest unmet needs in multiple myeloma are, are the high-risk patients who have a significantly worse outcome, and particularly when we go in, into the relapse refractory setting, patients who have seen prior therapies and relapse with high-risk high disease, I think they can get very quickly an idea whether immunotherapy or other, or other drugs are effective or not. Because in the relapsed refractory setting, uh, when patients have high-risk disease, uh, their general, in general terms, their outcome is not good. So it's easy to see whether a drug or an immunotherapy or any therapy makes a difference in that setting. Mm -hmm. And I think when you were talking about the use of potential therapies that you took from childhood leukemias or other drugs, so something, th this happened with thalidomide at UAMS, um, taking something that was being treated for other diseases and taking that. What Can you share what you think is the ideal process for trying to find these other therapies that might be used right now in lung cancer or prostate cancer or something else and apply them to myeloma? Well, the, the idea is to look for particular mutations for which there are drugs available. So, so sequencing the genes of the myeloma cells is the way to do that. And that's something that we and other centers are currently adopting. So that's an evolving field. So I think the first step is to identify whether a patient um, has a mutation for which there is a drug available. And obviously the next step is then to determine whether that that drug actually has clinical efficacy. So mm -hmm. this, this whole area is very early in its in its development. How much does it cost to sequence the genome for myeloma right now? If you do a limited sequencing, on, uh, it's probably in the order of a thousand dollars. More extensive sequencing is obviously more more expensive. And does insurance uh, pay for that sequencing? Some insurances do pay for uh, sequencing. Other sequencing, obviously, is done on a research basis. So limited sequencing is available from, from a number of companies in the country. Hmm. Okay, well, maybe this, this might be an area where patients could start to request this. <laughs> uh, yes, the question is obviously first to, uh, uh, to identify the mutation, secondly, then get the drug approved because the mm -hmm. drug is, is used off-label, so to speak. And thirdly, we ha don't have a good clue yet uh, which of these drugs are really beneficial for the myeloma patient. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of question marks and unknowns. Well, I guess that leads to a follow-up question. And I know we're almost out of time, and I've kind of hogged all the questions. But um, what can patients help do to help you further your research? We are always very... Uh, Grateful that patients are willing to donate samples for research, both blood samples and, and marrow cells. And we're also grateful that we can treat the patients and that we can have the long-term follow-up, which is so very important in multiple myeloma. And how do you do that follow-up? Because I know people move and insurance changes and, and all sorts of things. So how do you approach that at UAMS? We, we try to get everybody back and... If they're many years out, then we try to do at least a yearly visit 
there are truly places in which the uh, insurance changes or they're financially not able to come to AMS, and those patients we try to follow uh, up uh, uh, by phone and contact them once or twice a year and see how they're doing and get, get their uh, information for our database. The other thing, obviously, that we have is for our patients, we have a system in which they mail in monthly or two or three monthly multiple myeloma markers, and then the, uh, the myeloma protein is looked for in blood and urine, and we try to follow them uh, that way uh, to see whether there's any reemergence of the myeloma. Well, one final question. What, uh, what is the significance of, to you for patients participating in a clinical trial? I think clinical trials are very important. I think that's the way we find out whether drugs have uh, activity and contribute to improving progression-free and overall survival. And what we call what is referred to as correlative studies like gene expression profiling and sequencing studies and other studies allow us hopefully to identify subgroup of patients which really benefit from a specific drug. Well, Dr. Van Rey, we are so grateful that you joined us today. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? Because I know we're out of time. Uh, no, I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in the interview and uh, I think patient advocacy is extremely important and powerful uh, in the myeloma field and has been very helpful both in getting approved and in supporting and informing other patients. Well, we are very, very fortunate to have you working on the target for myeloma. And we wish you a great deal of success in your care for your patients and in your research. So please let us know as patients if there's anything else we can help you do. Okay, I will do so. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help accelerate a cure for multiple myeloma. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on ChumbaCasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's ChumbaCasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.